Texas. Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. This is your host, Ken Wise. I want to thank you for tuning in today for a little Texas history. You are listening to what I can now fairly call the award-winning Texas History Podcast. We just got uh, just got presented an award recently from the Texas chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution at the Texas State Convention. For my efforts to preserve and promote history, I'm so grateful to the Daughters of the American Revolution for that award. That's a wonderful group who's done countless things for this country in their 125-year-plus history, and it is an honor to be associated with them and certainly an honor to receive their award. We're not doing it for the award, but we are doing it for the commitment to preserving and promoting history that I know that I share with the daughters. So thank you very much, Texas DAR, for that wonderful honor. Things have been busy around Wise About Texas World Headquarters, as they always are. Um, I was invited to an actual Hollywood movie premiere that occurred during the South by Southwest Festival in Austin. It's a uh, movie that's in theaters now. Uh, This episode is being released in March 2019. It's coming to Netflix. It's called The Highwaymen, and there's going to be more to come on that in the very near future. Um, We're going to talk about Bonnie and Clyde. The movie The Highwaymen focuses on the former Texas Rangers who caught Bonnie and Clyde, specifically Frank Hamer and Manny Galt. It's wonderfully well done, and uh, look for that coming soon. Uh, This episode, as I mentioned, is being released in March 2019, right in the middle of the High Holy Days of Texas history. So today, we're going to talk about the Texas Revolution. When you read about the goings-on in Texas from the early 1830s up to the first shots in 1835, it seems that everyone just could not wait to go to war with Mexico. After all, Mexico had put Stephen F. Austin in prison. They tried to tax the citizens into poverty. They tried to take their property. Wasn't everyone ready to fight? Certainly after the folks in Gonzales dared the Mexican soldiers to come and take it, everyone was on board, weren't they? Well, not exactly. Even after Gonzales, Bejar, the Alamo, Goliad, there were those that not only didn't want to fight, they might have even helped the enemy. So let's take a look today at some Texas Tories. Now, put yourself back in the um, 1820s when Mexico was trying to populate Texas. Stephen F. Austin got his land grant, or took over his father, Moses Austin's land grant, is a better way to say it. And Mexico was looking forward to the immigration they were going to allow from the United States, how that was going to populate the far-flung province of Texas. And everything would be uh, copacetic. Well, of course, uh, it didn't work out that way, as we all know. Uh, It led to the law of 1830, which seriously hampered the desire of the immigrants, and as well as the lives of the ones who had already committed everything to Texas. Those laws were hard to enforce, however. And uh, they were unevenly enforced. But once those laws started to come into effect, all of a sudden settling in Texas didn't quite look or feel as good as it had at the front end. And the tensions began to rise. Now there were one of the first openly confrontational times occurred in Anahuac in 1832. And then we had a second Anahuac disturbance in 1835. But back in 32, the Mexican customs official was named John Davis Bradburn. Bradburn did some things with respect to collecting customs, and I won't get in too much into the details, but the citizens were displeased, to say the least, and they began to convene, and they set up a militia, uh, electing as captain a gentleman named Patrick Jack. Uh, Bradburn heard about this. He immediately had Jack arrested which, of course, did not sit well with the citizens. Eventually, a couple of the citizens, um, Robert M. Williamson, who was known by the nickname Three-Legged Willie, he had a paralyzed leg uh, to which he had attached a wooden leg. 
to help him get around, and he will get his own episode. Long-time listeners, don't worry. I promise we're going to get to three-legged Willie, Willie Williamson. And a gentleman, a doctor named Nicholas Labadee, managed to talk Bradburn into freeing Jack. Bradburn pulled a few more tricks on the citizens uh, that did not sit well with them. Um, Jack and William Barrett Travis uh, began agitating against Bradburn. That turned into armed confrontation and the arrest of Jack and Travis. We had uh, people coming from the Brazoria area down the Brazos to assist the citizens of Anahuac to try to free Jack and Travis. And I'm being vague on the details because, of course, the Anahuac disturbances are going to get their own episode, too. It's on the list. Don't worry. Uh, but suffice to say, there was armed conflict and uh, resulted in a battle in two places, in Anahuac, but also at Velasco as the citizens from the Brazos area tried to assist the citizens in the Anahuac area. One of the citizens of the area assisting Patrick Jack and William Barrett Travis was a gentleman named William Harden. What you don't read about much when you read about the Anahuac disturbances is the fact that uh, there were some Americans and apparently German immigrants, or would have been the earliest German immigrants, um, who assisted the Mexican authorities in enforcing Bradburn's decrees. In fact, this group specifically went after Hardin, um, saying they would get him dead or alive. They actually went on the hunt for him. He fled to a house of a man named Dorsat, hid under the bed while Dorsat's daughters uh, lay on top of the bed so that when the company would burst into the room, it appeared that they were bursting into these females' bedroom. Well, Mr. Dorsett ran in and demanded these men leave his daughter's bedroom when, unfortunately, William Harden, with his light sandy-colored hair, peeked out from underneath the bed to see the progress of the situation, at which point one of the men spotted him. Harden jumped up and ran straight through the side of Dorset's house, and he made his escape. So obviously the uh, boarding on those early Texas houses wasn't all that strong, and Hardin was uh, likewise motivated by the presence of these Mexican sympathizers. Now you may recall if you've studied the American Revolution that the British sympathizers on American soil were referred to as Tories, and that's what began the word that began to be used around Texas, if you read about the politics during this time period, and it would have been used, of course, because as you read about the politics, you see lots of re specific references to the American Revolution, to the rights secured by the United States Constitution, which, of course, would have nothing to do with Mexico, but nevertheless, that's what the Texas colonists believed and uh, held dear. And so we're going to use the word Tory to signify residents of Texas during the Revolution that sympathized with Mexico. Now, a little postscript to the Anahuac situation. Um, one account details that some of the people that sympathized with Bradburn during the disturbances were given, quote, a full suit of tar and feathers, whilst others were stripped and taken into the bay and scoured with corn cobs to scrub their Bradburn sins away. So uh, we don't know who these people were, but think about. Uh, being scoured with a corn cob in the uh, salt water of the bays near Anahuac. That would not feel too good. So uh, already the tension between what who would later become revolutionaries and the local Tories was in full bloom. Well, the question arises, what would be the difference? Why would someone uh, sympathize with Mexico over uh, their immigrant friends? And what would cause... Uh, versus what would cause people to sort of agitate and and uh, cause these disturbances. Surely it was bigger than a mere incident of customs enforcement or something like that. And I think when you read about this, what you find is a lot of the older citizens of Texas, and by 1832 there were people that had been here uh, legitimately under the laws of Mexico 10 years, uh, but probably a few longer than that, and uh, they tended to own land. They would have already been in possession of their land grants from Mexico. They would have agreed to abide by Mexican law and would have uh, been living happily in that situation, building life they intended to when they immigrated. And uh, you see some of the names of these sorts of people, including Stephen F. Austin, 
uh, Samuel May Williams, Thomas Jefferson Chambers. We covered him in episode 16. These were older men. They were in their 30s and 40s. And uh, the Patrick Jackson, William Barrett Travises of the world uh, had not been here that long, were younger and a little more feisty. By the way, one thing that uh, Patrick Jack and William Barrett Travis and Robert M. Williamson had in common is they were lawyers. You know what happens when the lawyers get involved. Anyway, in the early days uh, of the disturbances, that's kind of the difference that you see in uh, who was involved. Now, I mentioned the American Revolution, so let me just um, dig up a couple of things, uh, some of the writings of the time, to give you a flavor of how folks were thinking. Um, even the people that were professing loyalty to Mexico, and once once those disturb the Anahuac disturbances occurred in 32, 1832, uh, you had a scramble by some people to assure the Mexican authorities that everything was okay and that they were not on the side of any agitators, etc. Well, why would that occur? Well, one of the reasons is there were two kinds: uh, the, the politics and the military were both present in an official capacity in Texas. You had the political authorities, but you also had the military involved. And so that put an edge on everything because they could become active at any moment. So if you fast forward from uh, 1832 to 1835, when things started to really get heated, uh, you had these meetings occurring. One of them occurred at Columbia and the... Um, Council at Columbia, the Ayuntamiento, and again, apologies for my Spanish, but uh, the chair of a meeting that occurred in Columbia wrote the following, quote, the, uh, that the council would, quote, represent to you that the citizens of this jurisdiction hold themselves to be true, faithful, loyal, and unoffending Mexican citizens, that they do not violate the laws and constitution of the land, nor will they countenance others in doing it. So that was sent to the authorities on behalf of the citizens at Columbia. Uh, You had another public meeting at what was uh, a town of San Jacinto, which which existed uh, on Buffalo Bayou, of course, right across from um, sort of where the Texan army camped for the Battle of San Jacinto. It was gone by that time, but there was a town there or settlement. And there was a meeting there, and out of that meeting came the following, quote, We have always considered and do still consider the aggregate Mexican nation the rightful sovereign of the territory we occupy. So they were assuring the Mexican authorities that everything was well. But listen to what else they wrote. In that same document, they wrote this, quote, There are certain essential, sacred, and imprescriptible rights which must be guaranteed to every citizen We believe those rights may be as well secured under a consolidated as under a federative government, provided that government be wisely and liberally organized. Now, that's a very interesting statement. So what they're essentially saying is we don't care whether the Federalists or the Centralists, which was the Mexican political battle at the time, we don't care which one of you wins. As long as you secure certain essential, sacred, and imprescriptible rights. They didn't use unalienable, which was from the Declaration of Independence, but they did use sacred. And I'll tell you what those folks were saying was uh, they believed the same thing that's written in the United States Declaration of Independence. So if the uh, Mexican authorities had read a little more deeply into these statements, they would realize that it didn't really matter how much loyalty was professed. These uh, immigrants deeply believed that their natural rights had to be secured, and if the government were going to give or take certain rights, which is exactly what the government of Mexico believed they had the power to do, having recently been a monarchy, that there was going to be a problem. Later in 1835, uh, Colonel Ugarteca who was in uh, San Antonio, dismissed a lot of the explanations, saying that it would be useless for the colonists to make explanations unless they proved their loyalty by surrendering the radical leaders to the military authorities. So think about that for a minute. We hold dear our right uh, as Americans to petition our government for redress, to go and make a complaint, to make a protest. The Mexican authorities, however, 
decided to handle a situation by taking people who were making such petitions, demanding their surrender and arrest. So in other words, uh, prove your loyalty by giving your fellow citizens to the authorities. Well, that's a direct conflict, isn't it? So you can see where things were going. Well, who was winning? Well, the uh, self-interest prevailed, also a, a very American notion, and the idea that we can prosper economically uh, better without agitating the military authorities, uh, which was certainly true, was the prevailing uh, view. And the, the two parties, the two sides, the side that wanted peace and the side that wanted to further agitate against the injustices of the Mexican government called the War Party, um, the Peace Party was winning out. Uh, William Barrett Travis, even who was a firebrand of a War Party man, uh, even wrote that, the quote, the Peace Party make much the most noise, close quote, and advised his fellow War Party members to kind of stand down for a little bit. Uh, but soon after that, General Coase orders the arrest of William Barrett Travis. He, or, he orders the arrest of uh, Samuel May Williams, uh, orders the arrest of Lorenzo de Zavala. Now, de Zavala had done, uh, committed an unpardonable sin, and that is criticized Santa Ana. So Santa Ana was particularly interested in getting a hold of him. He had also left his post as a Mexican government official to uh, return and began to side with those advocating a change in government. All of this, of course, a surprise to the peaceful citizens uh, who had supported Santa Ana when he claimed to be a Federalist. Uh, he started consolidating power. Uh, listeners of this podcast are well familiar with the fact that Santa Ana sort of changed his mind and uh, became the dictator he claimed earlier to despise, uh, which, of course, further agitated the population. He then had... Austin arrested, and when Austin got back from prison, realized revolution was all but inevitable. So now the tone has changed. Now we're going to have a shooting war. And after the meetings and after the consultations, we come to October 1835, October 2nd. The citizens of Gonzales dare the Mexican troops to come and take the cannon that they had. Um, you had the Battle of Concepcion. And the, the revolution was on. But not everyone was on the same side. We all know about the Alamo, March of 36. Goliad, March of 36. We had the runaway scrape. We had the Battle of San Jacinto. I did an episode, episode 36, on the battles at Refurio and San Patricio. Episode 35 was the Battle of Tampico. But let's dig a little bit deeper and look and see if everybody believed the same thing. And I want to do this by telling you about a couple of incidents and a couple of people that showed that things were not always as they seemed. First, let's talk about San Patricio. Now, that's St. Patrick in Spanish, and it consisted of mostly Irish immigrants. These Irish colonists had lived in the area a little while. They had a Mexican garrison stationed at Fort Lepantadlan in the area, and they got along well uh, with everyone. The, the uh, San Patricio Town Council and the Mexican military got along very well. There was really no reason for them to revolt. Uh, somebody, some emissaries from the Texas revolutionaries came down there to try to get a little support, and they ended up getting arrested. So that uh, settled how the Irish colonists felt in that area. Um, when a force from Goliad went down to attack that fort, uh, many of those Irish colonists fought alongside the Mexican soldiers, and um, including the alcalde, or the former alcalde, a guy named William O'Doherty, or, or Doherty, depending on how you spell it, were wounded. The current alcalde, Henry Thomas, was severely wounded. The Goliad group went back to Goliad. The Mexican troops returned to the fort, so now you had a split San Patricio, and neither side was going anywhere. When Urea arrives in this area in 1836, and again, I refer back to episode 36 when we talked about the battles of Refurio and San Patricio, he found a fair amount of pro-Mexican feeling among the citizens. The famous De La Pena diary, the diary of uh, Jose Enrique De La Pena, uh, argued that uh, if Santa Ana had been a little kinder with his orders, 
in the San Patricio area, the entire group of citizens would have supported Mexico. But at the end of the day, um, the citizens favored Texas. There were several Irish soldiers on the Texas side, as we now know, and uh, to my knowledge, none of those uh, San Patricians fought in the Mexican army. But it just shows that uh, even as late as 1836, uh, there were pockets of folks in Texas that really just wanted uh, not to be involved. Well, speaking of not wanting to be involved, what if you had lived here a lot longer than just a few years? In other words, what about the Tejano feeling as the revolution sort of emerged uh, on land that they had already been living on for a good deal of time? Well, this gets a little complicated because the Texas Revolution, as we think of it, started in late 1835. But the Mexican Revolution really was a Texas Revolution in large measure. You already had the centralist-federalist conflict before the Anglo colonists arrived. When you uh, put the Anglo colonists in the mix, you still have the centralist-federalist conflict flavored with, of course, American notions of government. But you also have some racial tension that comes into play. And you have the situation when two competing armies are conducting battle through towns and ranches and settlements uh, where people are already living. Here's what I mean. We know about the political conflicts, but the racial tensions were also very significant. In fact, Sam Houston himself argued that the Americans and the Mexicans were not destined to get along. He used in Indian metaphor, as you might expect from Sam Houston, saying, two di- quote, two different tribes on the same hunting ground will never get along together, close quote. Now, it's always easier to make an argument that appeals to base prejudice than it is to examine person's beliefs individually. And there were plenty of politicians who simply said, Tejanos were Tories, and left it at that. Well, of course, that's ridiculous. Because, as I mentioned, the conflict existed before uh, the people making those statements ever came to Texas. So while uh, those generalized allegations were invalid on their basis, uh, they were not necessarily invalid on the facts, on the performance, because there were plenty of native Tejanos acting on behalf of the Mexican army, uh, primarily providing intelligence as the army made its way into Texas. There were many native Tejanos who became spies and scouts for Urea, especially at the Battle of San Patricio. And you had several uh, Tejano families in Bejar um, taking up arms and helping the Mexican army. And obviously, if you were in Bejar, you would have, it would have appeared to you that the Mexicans were destined to win the revolution. Now, one other thing about a revolution being fought on your soil and what it can do to your loyalty, you had a situation where the uh, Texas revolutionaries had, when they sieged, besieged Bejar, uh, that led to house-to-house fighting at the siege of Bejar. And so the citizens who lived in those houses obviously would have better memories of that situation. You also had uh, many instances where Texan behavior was not uh, probably civilized, and uh, that would raise agitation. Of course, the same thing occurred with the Mexican army. Uh, When these armies are moving back and forth uh, fighting this war, uh, they're taking cattle and supplies from the population. So depending on where you were at what time, uh, you would have been embittered toward whatever particular army had, uh, in your opinion, mistreated you. So it was a very difficult situation for the Tejanos, and accordingly, their loyalties were split, despite the politics. I want to switch gears for a minute and talk about a specific individual to give you an idea of what a Texas Tory was like. That individual was John A. Williams. Williams lived in Liberty, and um, in April 1835, uh, he was on the council, the town council, and he wrote a document that he called Quote, resolutions urging moderation, respect for authority, obedience to law, condemning extreme views, 
demanding suppression of all unlawfulness. And he purported to speak in that document for the entire Ayuntamiento of Liberty. So you can see right away the feeling that prevailed uh, in the people that had been here a little longer and were more established, that, they, that we wanted to obey the law, and that, of course, is a very American notion, and uh, moderate our views and respect authority, and that's what he wrote. Some of the other things he said were things like, quote, a proper obedience to the laws is the first duty of a good citizen, close quote. He wrote about uh, people desiring to change the law, but also noted, quote, this modification is only to be affected by the National Congress, close quote. Williams was also uh, quick to condemn the uh, Anahuac disturbances. When the Anahuac disturbances occurred, he wrote a letter to the political chief in Nacogdoches and said, quote, the threats of the people of Austin's colony, now note that he's speaking about them as if they're you know, some distant third party. The threats of the people of Austin's colony against the town of Anahuac have been carried into effect, close quote. Now you see with that, you also see someone who's established at Liberty in the eastern part of Texas complaining basically of people who have settled on the Brazos, the newcomers. Later he writes, uh, describing the action, quote, about half an hour afterwards, the answer came and a little in its rear came the enemy and took possession of the town, close quote. So now he's referring to his fellow immigrants as the enemy. Isn't that interesting? Here's what else he writes. Quote, the authorities of San Felipe are raising troops to capture San Antonio and rescue the governors, etc., etc., also making arrangements to form treaties with the Indians, close quote. Well, that would be quite the indictment uh, if communicated to a Nacogdoches authority in 1835. So you can see that Williams was trying to uh, create a very bright line divide between the people of his area, specifically him, and everyone else. The Indian reference is interesting because uh, that would put some fear in uh, the authorities' hearts, but, you know, uh, there was a lot of agitation amongst the revolutionaries that the Indians were actually going to unite with the Mexicans and fight on their side, so much so that uh, at a critical time in February 1836, Sam Houston actually traveled to East Texas to talk to the Cherokee and make sure they weren't going to intervene on the Mexican side. So, they were being used as threat, uh, viewed as threats by both sides. As popular opinion turned almost unanimously to revolution, John A. Williams didn't give an inch. He remained a Tory until the end. I found a letter, uh, October 1835, that uh, they were discussing arresting John Williams along with others. Now, this is early in the process, October 1835. We're just getting started, but uh, Williams was already on the list. And really got there uh, because once the Anahuac disturbances occurred, uh, you really needed to pick sides. And once you picked them, it was hard to switch. Another story, by the way, that occurred after San Jacinto, we had some Mexican prisoners. I mentioned William Harden. He had a plantation, and several of the Mexican prisoners were taken to his plantation to work. And uh, there was a story about two of the Mexican officers escaping, and they escaped with some assistance. Now, this is after San Jacinto. And there are still people in that Liberty area who are assisting these Mexican prisoners escape. And uh, one of the places that they took these Mexican prisoners was Louisiana. And if you read the story, it says, quote, the Mexicans were taken to Lake Charles in Opelousas, aided by John A. Williams, a former resident of the Liberty District, who had to flee because of his political beliefs. So eventually they ran John Williams out of the country. Williams, by the way, did eventually come back to Texas. He uh, died in 1840 in Jefferson County. Now let's go to the other side of the ledger and talk about a revolutionary who, uh, shall we say, interacted with the Tories. This individual was named David Kokernot, K-O-K-E-R-N-O-T. Kokernot was born in Holland. He was born in 1805. Uh, he was living in New Orleans and was sent to sea by his father, sent to a place called the Belize, which is where the pilots were trained, 
and he was eventually shipwrecked and taken to Anawak, and he ended up moving his entire family to Anawak in 1832. He quickly picked sides because he participated in the Anawak disturbances. He joined the Army. He was at the Battle of Concepcion. He was at the Grass Fight. He was an officer in the Army by November of 1835, and it appears that he arrived at San Jacinto after the battle was over because he had evacuated his family to Galveston. But he was involved in an interesting incident shortly after the battle. Just east of the San Jacinto River, and uh, I'll post a picture of the old map on the website, is a place noted as Torrey Hill. Now, this would have been the southern portion of that area where folks like John A. Williams and others were living, the Liberty, Anahuac area, and the older settlements and the established uh, merchants and cattlemen. Well, supposedly, a group of these Tories assembled on Torrey Hill to observe the Battle of San Jacinto. Now, there's a great account uh, written down by an early Texas Baptist preacher named Z.N. Morell. Here's how he describes it. Quote, They assembled on Torrey Hill as the time drew near and awaited the result of the struggle that was to decide the fate of the nation. Trembling with anxiety at every breath, those miserable, cowardly Tories stood refugees from justice, murderers, thieves, perjurers, forgers, their consciences seared with a hot iron, their eyelids smoked with the perfumes from the bottomless pit, and with the stillness of death watching and waiting for the issue. Close quote. My goodness, I wish I could come up with that to describe a group of people waiting for a battle to start. Pastor Morell, of course, being on the side of the Texans. By the way, he later describes that crowd on Torrey Hill as, quote, some trifling backslidden Baptists and fallen from grace Methodist, close quote. That, that, that about sums it up for you right there. Anyway, these folks were uh, gathered to watch the battle, and after the battle, it said that Sam Houston ordered Coconut to go over to Torrey Hill and the surrounding area and round up the cattle and horses east of the San Jacinto River, quote, except those of honest citizens, close quote, meaning not Tories. Oh, by the way, apparently uh, in Santa Ana, or excuse me, allegedly in Santa Ana's baggage, there was a list of Mexican sympathizers in Texas, and many of them were seen on Torrey Hill. At least that's the story. In any event, Coconut heads over to uh, carry out Sam Houston's orders. And by the way, when I say the, the Houston orders were to round up all the cattle, what he wanted to do, what Houston wanted was for him to go east of the San Jacinto, which was a haven for the Tories, and bring the cattle and horses back across the San Jacinto to uh, the army. So Coconut, Coconut took his men and uh, stopped to, uh, let's say, fortify the expedition uh, by stopping at his, at Coconut's house. Um they didn't capture any Tories at his house, uh, but they did capture the rem- remnants of his whiskey supply. So after uh, the whiskey ran out, they continued on their mission uh, to round up all these Tories. Uh, they didn't. Uh, they did mount one charge against a group of women who reportedly gave them such a tongue lashing that they were forced to retreat, as only you can imagine Texas women would do. He should have known better than to charge. Coconut continued, but his men started to peel off when it became apparent that he was mostly out for for revenge, and it turned into pretty much of a disaster. In fact, uh, when he got back to and reported to Sam Houston, uh, Coconut himself described the meeting this way, quote, I reported my acts to the commander-in-chief and got a hell of a cursing, close quote. Whatever cattle he had rounded up were redistributed to the owners. But that was not the end of the coconut story. He must have done a heck of a job of making the population mad because about 10 years later, coconut, who still lived in Liberty, by the way, was indicted for stealing a beef, stealing a cow. So who do you think coconut engaged as his personal lawyer? Sam Houston. That's right. Now, people don't, you don't talk about Sam Houston as a lawyer very much, but uh, he was. 
Uh, in fact, he had been a district attorney in Tennessee at one point. So Coconut gets Houston to defend him, and Houston, of course, was well known to be loyal to his uh, former soldiers. So Houston, the, the court was to convene at Liberty. Well, Houston managed to convince the Liberty Court that it was inconvenient for him to attend court in Liberty, and would they transfer venue of the case to Walker County, where Houston resided, which they did. So now Coconut is going to trial in Walker County, and who should appear on the jury but a couple of soldiers who had fought for Houston at San Jacinto. Well, the prosecution put their case on. They said that some riders had uh, been riding on the prairie and that they saw coconut and a woman skinning a beef. They looked at the brand and knew that it was uh, the brand of a man named Harding who was named in the indictment as the owner and somehow had divined that the beef was taken without his consent. Now, these are the people that Coconut had harassed 10 years earlier. So Houston, when it came his turn, employed the tactics of many great criminal defense lawyers and put the witness on trial rather than his client. And he asked the witness, didn't you observe the Battle of San Jacinto? The witness said, yep. He said, didn't, weren't you on Torrey Hill? The witness said, yep. And what'd y'all do when it became obvious that the Texans had won? And the witness said, well, we dispersed. The witness admitted there was cheering for the Mexican cannons. And Houston called some witnesses for the defense, old soldiers who talked about how important Coconut was to the Army. Houston's closing argument conducted of painting a wonderful picture of the Tories on Tory Hill, the dispersal after the battle, seeing Coconut coming on the warpath towards them. And old Sam Houston concluded by saying, quote, Gentlemen of the jury, the pretended owner of the beef alleged to have been stolen was a Tory. He fled the country under the just indignation and patriotic wrath of my client, Captain Coconut, and how dare one of those Tories to charge my client with stealing a beef. Let your patriotism and devotion to Texas dictate your verdict. Well, it doesn't get any better than that, does it? The jury found Mr. Coconut not guilty. But the jury did more than that. They said if the state's witnesses did not leave town within five minutes, they'd be treated to a coat of tar and feathers and rode out on a rail to the tune of Rogue's March. I guess it's always been better to be for Texas. Now we come to the part of the episode I call Getting There, where I tell you how to go see some of the places we referred to in the episode. This episode ranged far and wide from the Sabine all the way down to the Nueces, so we're not going to have you drive all that way, but I'll tell you a couple of spots you might want to see. Uh, Torrey Hill was on the east side of the San Jacinto River. If you'll go get on the Lynchburg Ferry uh, on the east side of the road, uh, the landing on the Crosby side of the river, uh, you'll be generally in the vicinity of Torrey Hill. Uh, Burnett's Plantation, David Burnett's Plantation was near there, and uh, we have subdivisions and chemical plants in the area now, but uh, you'll be close enough for government work if you're on that side. Um, a little postscript on David Coconut. He, um, along with uh, some of his sons and one of his brothers, uh, they began ranching in West Texas, That's in the Coconut name is uh, very prominent in the Alpine area. Uh, in fact, in the town of Alpine, you'll find Coconut Field, where a minor league baseball team plays. Um, always a good trip uh, to go over to Anahuac. If you go to uh, Fort Anahuac Park, which is on South Main Street in Anahuac, a beautiful spot, especially at sunset, uh, you'll find a number of historical markers regarding the Anahuac disturbances and William Barrett Travis and Patrick Jack and be right in the middle of a bunch of great Texas history. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention again San Felipe de Austin State Historic Site. There's a brand new museum there on the site, and it's Texas's newest history museum, and it's a great place to visit. You can see the town site of San Felipe as they continue to do some great archaeology out there. Well, that wraps it up for another episode of Wise About Texas. We've got a lot of New episodes coming your way this spring. I appreciate you tuning in today. Uh, tell a friend about the show if you get a chance, and uh, let's spread the word about Texas history. 
We're on Facebook, Wise About Texas, and you can follow the show on Instagram and Twitter at Wise About Texas. Thanks again for tuning in today. Go out and do something for Texas. Until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.